Good evening, Pounder Rapids Chapel. My name is Adam Feek, and I'm a morning student with Pounder. I'm in my second year, and tonight's service will be going out on the 25th of November, 2020. Our speaker tonight will be Adam Skirton. He will be bringing us God's Word from Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. He's going to be giving us three different application points, which I'm not going to spoil here, but the second one did stand out to me in particular. And it's something that I want to reflect on quickly before we carry on with the rest of the service. The second point was enduring the present. And it made me think about Jesus's humanity and how he helps us endure the present. So the early church affirmed scriptural truth through the um, creating of creeds. These creeds have been passed down through generations and help us connect with those who have gone before us. The Creed of Chalcedon in AD 451 affirmed the truth of Christ's nature, that he is both fully human and fully divine. Not 50-50, but both fully human and fully divine. And it's through reading these creeds that back up scriptural truth that we can learn to worship Jesus in all his entirety. So I'm going to read the creed for you and then we will have a quick reflection on the meaning of this creed before going on to tonight's reading. So the Creed of Chalcedon. Therefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance with the Father as regards in his Godhead, and at the same time one of one substance with us as regards his manhood, like us in all respects apart from sin, as regards his Godhead begotten of the Father before the ages, but yet as regards his manhood begotten for us men and for our salvation of Mary the Virgin the God-bearer. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognised in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the distinction of natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and subsistence, not as parted or separated in two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God the Word, Lord Jesus Christ even as the prophets from earliest times spoke of him, and our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and the creed of the fathers handed down to us. Amen. So this creed really focuses on Jesus's divinity and Jesus's humanity, this nature that he is fully man, but also fully God. So what does Jesus's divinity mean for us? Well, we have a true knowledge of God, for whoever has seen the Son has seen the Father. It also means that redemption is available to us. It was not just a finite human who died on the cross, but an infinite God who did not need to die for the world, but out of his love he chose to, to step out of heaven and to come to us. God and humanity have been reunited. God himself crossed over the chasm of sin. Jesus is God in the same sense and to the same degree as the Father, and because of this he is worthy of every praise. And Jesus' is humanity, what does this mean for us? Oh, Jesus was not some outsider who died on the cross, but one of us, and therefore could truly offer a sacrifice on our behalf. Jesus can truly sympathise with us. He experienced all that we go through. He endured suffering, hunger, pain and sorrow. He knows how we feel, and this is why we can endure in the present, knowing that Jesus is with us. Jesus knows what we're going through. Jesus shows us the true nature of humanity, not the fallen and sinful humanity, but the humanity God intended all to be. Jesus is not some celestial superstar. He slept on the same earth where we lay our heads. He shows us how we should live in the present. Jesus shows that God is not totally transcendent. God lived on this earth and continues to act in the human realm this day. So when we are going through troubles, when we are going through difficulties, Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. He was fully human. He understands our pains. So we can turn to him and empty out our hearts before him, for he knows. Now, Father in heaven, we thank you for the truth that is your son, both fully human and fully divine. We thank you that he died on the cross for us to put, put us right with you, that we now can be in relationship with you. Help us keep our eyes transfixed on him and learn to love all those around us as we endure the present. 
Lord, I pray that tonight our ears will be ready to hear what Adam is bringing to us. May you open our hearts to receive the message. May we learn to love you more and each other through learning more of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people, and again praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. To him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Adam. Good evening, everybody. As we've seen in the last couple of weeks, chapter 14 was all about accepting each other, whether Jews or Gentiles, and not judging each other, not falling out over disputable matters like the food you eat or, or what days are special, whether you voted remain or leave, or whether you prefer hymns or hill songs. Actually, Paul didn't mention this last two, but you, you catch my drift. You know, we can disagree without being disagreeable. That's what he's trying to get across. In chapter 15, the church in Rome are firstly told a load of things they need to be doing, Secondly, shown how Jesus did them, um, the example he gave for us, uh, and the need to be living like Jesus, as we often phrase it at PBC. And thirdly, it's explaining how to live this way like Jesus. So we're going to be exploring the passage under three headings this evening. Firstly, learning from the past, that's in the first four verses. And then I'm going into enduring in the present. Okay, they didn't have COVID-19, but they had some even bigger dangers that they were facing back then. And thirdly, um, we're going to be looking at having hope for the future. That's particularly in verse 13. We could all do with a bit of hope at the moment, couldn't we? In fact, the theme of hope comes up a lot. We could summarise the whole thing with the phrase, living like Jesus um, brings us hope. Living like Jesus brings us hope. So if you're looking for hope, stay with us this evening or whenever you're listening. So number one, learning from the past. It says first few verses again. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. But everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide we might have hope so who are the strong and the weak mentioned here well this follows up from the previous chapter um other sort of helpful information explanation is is found at the end of um, 1 corinthians 10 but the weak it seems are mainly jewish christians who are struggling to realise they no longer need to keep to the food laws, etc., from the old covenant, and that they're struggling to let go of the old religious traditions. They may have considered themselves the original, therefore the superior, might have had a bit of an issue with Paul calling them the weak. The strong, it seems, are what Paul is calling the mainly Gentile believers, who have no problem letting go of the old religious practices because they probably never followed them in the first place. Previously, Paul had been kind of saying, guys, stop looking down at each other. Stop bickering with each other. You're one in Christ as you trust in him. 
And for the first time, um, Paul, a, a previously hyper religious Jew, um, a kind of Pharisee, identifies himself with the strong. He says, We who are strong, people who are saved by faith in Christ, Jews and Gentiles alike, not by works or absorbing the law. Here's the kind of, well, that's the deeper background on the, on the surface. Um, it's also relevant also. The, the church in Rome, who originally received this letter and us reading 2,000 years later, are instructed to do certain things. Those who are strong need to bear with the failings of the weak. Literally, it says, those who are able need to be carrying the infirmities of those who are unable. Bear with. It means help them shoulder, help them carry. Those who are feeling strong need to um, be playing our part in supporting others in the church family. Those with more finances will be giving more financially. Those with more disposable time will be using their time for others, phoning, writing, praying. Together, we're a family, one body. And those of us who are feeling weaker at the moment through age or illness or circumstances need to be willing to accept help. Allow others to help carry the burdens. Verse 2 summarises, each of us should please our neighbours for their good to build them up. I love that picture of building up rather than tearing down. It's like Jesus saying in Luke 6.31, do to others as you would have them do to you. Like we read in Philippians 2, we need to look out for the interest of others. Verse 3 here reminds us again, like in Philippians 2, that Jesus is the supreme example of this. He suffered our infirmities, our weakness. Verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who have insult you have fallen on me. That quote comes from Psalm 69, verse 9. The whole verse, zeal for your house consumes me and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. It's quoted by Jesus when he, or quoted of Jesus when he cleared the temple in in John 2. And Psalm 69 is quoted many times in the New Testament. It's about Jesus' suffering. And the psalm goes on in verse 21 to say, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Fulfilled by the ultimate example of someone carrying others' burdens by Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. Paul concludes this part saying, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So the the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, are there to teach us. And Paul's going to give us some examples to teach us from the Old Testament. So here's the question. Are we reading the scriptures? If we want to learn, we need to be reading them. And if we are reading them, are we obeying them? Um, What are the consequences of that? Well, Paul explains. He says so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So, So reading and obeying the scriptures gives us endurance, gives us encouragement and gives us hope. Hope despite the circumstances and the suffering. Friends, what is the secret of having hope? It's about having endurance. It, it's here, and we're going to hear more about that in a moment. The secret of having hope is reading the scriptures and having the truth of God's hope ingrained in us. We need to learn from the past. So as well as one, learning from the past, we need to be two, enduring in the present. And we've we've already seen some of that as we bear with each other, carrying each other's burdens, putting our neighbour's interests first, building each other up. That might mean, as I said earlier, being willing to receive help from others, as well as at times giving help to others. It's important we're able to receive and we're able to give and pray for, for God's blessing on each other. Quick story before we move on about an exhausted young mum who got a phone call one morning and the voice on the other end said hi it's your mum I know things aren't easy at the moment so I'm going to be coming over shortly going to look after the children going to clean the house do the ironing while you go out shopping spending some money I'm going to be giving you and tonight I'm going to be paying for a takeaway meal so that you and Mike can have a lovely relaxing evening together the young mother said great but but who's Mike the older mum said your husband? Young mum said, 
Uh, no, my, my husband's called Pete. What number do you think this is? The reply, 871123. Young man said disappointedly, no, this is 871132. But added, hopefully, you can still come round if you want. <laughs> Friends, who are we going to um, carry this week? Who are we going to build up this week? Who are we going to pray for this week? So firstly, we need to be learning from the past and, and, and read from God's word. And, and secondly, as we've seen already, we need to be carrying others and, and building them up. We need to be enduring in the present. Verse five continues. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Jesus Christ had. So that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. And then Paul quotes a load of Old Testament scriptures that we'll look at in a moment. So God can give in endurance and encouragement. And at the end, we're going to pray that, that God would give us that encouragement and, and endurance and hope that we need today. As we endure in the present we're to have the same attitude of mind towards each other that Jesus had. So we can glorify God with one mind and one voice, standing fully united together. You know, as I look back over this last week, it's been a real joy to spend some time on Zoom, praying with groups of church leaders from other places, from um, churches across Ringwood, from churches across the Bournemouth area, and also um, churches across the New Forest, united, enduring together in Jesus Christ. We could have spent our time debating our differences, but instead we chose not to quarrel, but to love with the mind of Christ. And verse 5 um, says, may God give us that same attitude of mind towards each other. Literally translated, spirit of unity among yourselves and as verse 6 continues so that with one mind and one voice we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ one mind one heart literally one heart and one mouth is what Paul writes the body of Christ is to beat with one heart and speak with one mouth. As Douglas Moo puts in his excellent application commentary on this passage, only when believers cease to quarrel with one another and speak with one heart and one voice will they be able to praise God as they should. You see, unity not only blesses us, it brings pleasure to God. And that's what we want to do as our worship to him. It's not surprising, really, those of us who are parents know that great feeling of joy we experience when we see our children getting on with each other. And we know how painfully it is when we see them bickering with each other also. So as part of enduring in the present, verse 7 says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. In our church at PBC, you know, we have people from all walks of life from a variety of ethnic backgrounds, it's a joy to choose to be one in Christ. Verse 7 says again, we, we choose to accept one another, just as, meaning because, Christ accepts us in order to bring praise to God. You know, the potential division in the church in Rome 2,000 years ago was even greater with that mixture of Jews and Gentiles and the different backgrounds they came from. That's why Paul reminds them of how God sent Jesus to the Jews so the Gentiles also could come to know God. And also that's why it's prophesied that the Gentiles would also come to praise God. Paul quotes what seems like four random Old Testament passages next. Are they random? Well, no, of course they're not. That the first is, is found in two places, in 2 Samuel twenty two fifty 50 and, and Psalm eighteen forty nine, 
And, and the last three are examples from um, the Torah, the, the, the law, the, the writings and the prophets. Basically saying, look, the whole Old Testament points towards this truth that Jesus died for the Gentiles as well as for the Jews. He truly is the saviour of the world. The Jews are included. Sorry, the Gentiles are included as well as the Jews. We're all one in Jesus. Let's quickly look at those Old Testament quotes. Because for many of the initial hearers of this letter, as soon as they heard a quote, just a single verse, they would have known the context, the verses around the ones mentioned. Let me read them one by one. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. 2 Samuel 22 is almost word for word the same as Psalm 18, written by King David, seen as their greatest king. So this verse here, it is the second to last verse um, in, in, in the chapter, in, in, in Psalm 18. I will praise you among the nations, meaning the Gentile nations. The Gentiles are included. It was always God's plan to unite all people in Jesus Christ. Next quote, verse 10. Again, it says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. It's from Deuteronomy 32, 43, in the Torah, the law. Who wrote those words? Moses, their greatest leader. Paul's already quoted from Deuteronomy 32, 21 in, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 19. Basically he's saying the Gentiles are included. It was always God's plan to unite all people in Jesus Christ. The third quote, verse 11. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the peoples extol him. It's from Psalm 117, verse 1 in the writings. They would have known the next verse. I mean, the, the Psalm's only got two verses. This is the shortest Psalm. Verse 2 says, for great is his love towards us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. What's he saying? <laughs> the Gentiles are included. It's always been God's plan to unite all people in Jesus Christ. And the final quote, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. It's from Isaiah 11 verse 10 from the prophets. Isaiah the most famous one at that. Isaiah 11 starts, the shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from its roots a branch will bear fruit, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. It's referred to by the gospel writers Matthew and John about Jesus' baptism, it's a prophecy about the Messiah, we often read it at Christmas. Let's unpack it for a moment. Jesse was King David's father, so the the shoot of Jesse will be David. But the root of David, well, that points backwards to his, his, his ancestors in the past, ultimately, to Jesus Christ himself. At the time of Paul's writing, most people there had never really heard of Jesus, but Jesus is indeed the king of kings, the one in whom people can hope. And Paul goes on to write about that hope offered in Jesus Christ. So, so overall, these passages have not been randomly chosen. They, they back up the truth. Paul is explaining that Jews and Gentiles alike are welcome. It was always God's plan to unite all people in Jesus Christ. We might not need to keep all the intricacies of the great of, of the old covenant. The Gentiles then would have been saying, "Yes, great," but we still need to read and know the Old Testament. The Jews would have been saying, absolutely, yes. So in summary, the good news of Jesus transforms individuals and forms communities uniting people together. The heart of the gospel is the message of God's um, justifying work in Jesus Christ. But God also wants to put people transformed by Jesus into little communities or families, churches that, that reflect the values of the gospel. To share many times before. Think of the shape of the cross made up of two, two bits of wood. The vertical post reminds us of our reconciliation with God 
through faith in Jesus. And the horizontal post? Well, it reminds us of our, our reconciled relationship, one with each other. Jew and Gentile, one body in Jesus Christ. So we're to be learning from the past as we read God's word, both Old and New Testament. And secondly, carrying others and building them up so we can be enduring in the present, being united together and accepting each other, whoever we are. So number one, learning from the past. Number two, enduring in the present. And finally, and, and briefly, having hope for the future. What a beautiful prayer to finish this evening. Verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, God is the source of hope. People are desperate for hope at the moment. People don't know where to turn to. There's been talk this week of the, the wonder of science getting the vaccines ready in an unbelievably short amount of time. I mean, praise God, they are getting ready. And I'm grateful for the hard work of the scientists, but I believe it was God who gave them creative and searching minds and skills. It was God who created a logical universe where these sorts of interventions are possible. It was God who's, who's guiding and uniting people across the nations in a wonderful way. And it's God who is the source of hope, not science alone. I say that with all due respect to our scientific community, many of whom are Christians anyway. It's God who can give joy and peace. And not just some, but he, he can fill us with that joy and peace. I love the definition of joy as peace dancing. And of peace as joy resting. Picture and ponder those for just a moment. Peace breaking into a dance. It's called joy. And joy having a, a rest. It's called peace. God wants to fill us with these things, even in our uncertain circumstances today. The God of hope offers us joy and peace. And we're going to take him up on the offer and pray for each other in just a moment. What is the prerequisite for us being filled with this hope and joy and peace? Well, as we've just read, we, we receive, Paul writes, as you trust in him. We need to choose to put our trust in him. And then and only then can we know real hope, lasting joy and perfect peace. How do we trust? The Greek word used here is sometimes translated believe in and sometimes trust in. Why? Because it kind of means both in a sense. There's grammatical reasons why they, they make the differences. But, but very simply, in reality, the word means more than just believing about. It's more of a trusting in. Paul is not talking about head knowledge. He's talking about a heart response. He's not talking just about intellect. He's talking action, living faith. A few weeks ago for my birthday, we went um, climbing to the, the Bear Grylls Adventure Place in Birmingham. We had safety ropes as we went up the wall. And initially, you know, I, I believe the safety rope would work, but I kind of was struggling to trust it. So I climbed a few metres up and I thought I'll just lean back and just just um, just prove to myself that it works before I go any higher. Um, to, to be honest, <laughs> even a metre or two off the ground, I, I found it difficult to, to lean back and, and trust in that rope. But once I did, I was a bit more confident and at peace about my future. God has proved himself utterly trustworthy and invites us to lean back and to fully trust in him to know that yes often what we face is well beyond us but we don't have to face it alone when we trust in Jesus we face the future with him we can have hope for the future we admit our, our weakness we confess our fears and we hear his voice speaking from from 2 Corinthians 12 9 my grace is sufficient for you, for my power 
is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about weaknesses, writes Paul there, so, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. Maybe Paul would write it right now, in, even in COVID. For when I am weak, then I am strong. As we confess our weakness, express our need and profess afresh our trust in Christ. As we lean back on the rope, knowing he's got us, as George Verber often signs his, his letters, we're in his grip. We're safe as we trust. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we indeed may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the wonderful thing is, not only does God give us a little bit of hope, he gives us enough. He gives us so much that we might overflow with hope. Are you overflowing with hope at the moment? Are other people catching some of that hope? Or do you need a bit of a top up tonight or whenever you're listening? Are you overwhelmed with worries and fears? Let's ask right now for God's hope to be released in us by the power of the Holy Spirit as we unite together in prayer. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we come to you in humility, confessing our weakness, expressing our need of Jesus and professing our trust in him. Firstly, God, please would you help us read your word daily so that we can indeed learn from the past. Secondly, God, would you be helping us carrying others and building them up and, and where we need to be ourselves, being carried by others and being built up. Help us, God, to be enduring in the present. May, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give us tonight that, that same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unite us, we pray. Help us accept each other. And finally, God, we choose again to trust you, Lord, we thank you that we are indeed safe in your grip. You're better than the, the safest of safety ropes. You're utterly trustworthy. You'll never let us down. May the God of hope fill us afresh with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Adam, for tonight's inspiring message. And yes, we do pray that we will be a beacon of hope to all those that we encounter. That through the Holy Spirit, our hope will overflow to those around us. And they may catch a glimpse of the love of God and the trust that we have in him. Next week, we will be carrying on um, from where we left off in Romans 15. And we do hope you can join us then. And as well, if you could join us on Sunday morning. I just want to close with some words from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weakness, weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Have a great week from all of us here, and we'll see you soon. God bless. <laughs>